Welcome to the Healthy Heart Show, where we pull back the curtain on conventional medicine and dive into the root causes of cardiovascular health. If you are concerned about high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, or atrial fibrillation, this is the place for you. We will provide natural heart information that will help you prevent, treat, and reverse any ailment, leaving pills and procedures out of the picture. Here are your guides to holistic heart health, board-certified cardiologist and Amazon best-selling author, Dr. Jack Wolfson, and natural heart doctor, naturopathic physician, Dr. Lauren Latanza. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Healthy Heart Show. I am Dr. Lauren Latanza, naturopathic physician here at Natural Heart Doctor, eager to bring you part two of my discussion with Dr. John Kim. He's a functional medicine pharmacist. I really encourage you to go back and listen to part one of this discussion. We just had so many wonderful clinical tidbits about hormones and kind of everything that surrounds that as we age. Um, what to look for, how to live. So really, I would say go back and listen to part one if you haven't already, but there was so much great information that we had to develop a part two, which is what we will bring you today. So welcome to part two of our show, Dr. John Kim. Dr. Lauren, thank you so much for inviting for the second time. Uh, That was a deep discussion we actually had on part one. So I encourage everybody to go back and listen to that. I mean, we went from hormones to many things in dealing with the myth behind hormones. So hopefully uh, that would open a lot of eyes for people as well as the second part. It's going to be a very interesting part we're going to discuss. So let's get going. All right. So uh, we started to kind of gain some traction about talking about hormone replacement therapy in part one, but it is such a hot topic and on so many people's minds, maybe a lot of women that are listening are actually on hormone replacement therapy, or they're kind of on the fence thinking, should I be on hormone replacement therapy? Um, So what are, I mean, just kind of from the get-go, what are some pros and cons that we can just look at? Should I be on hormone replacement therapy? Should I not? What are the risks involved? Um, What are your thoughts? You know, it really depends on the person and what their overall lifestyle goal is, right? It's not about just everybody needing it. I mean, I got into this whole thing with functional medicine, anti-aging medicine back in 2008. And when I was going through my own fellowship training and I thought everybody needed hormone, but once you end up having to get into the whole clinical aspect of it and really listen to patients, what their overall lifestyle goal is, not everybody needs hormones. So if you're dealing with severe hot flashes and nothing's really helping you out, then hormones might be a better choice for you. Maybe you want to actually be much more vibrant, having a lot more libido and energy in that aspect of it and improving your life. The hormones might be could be one good thing, but do they need that to achieve all those things? Not particularly. So I want to take that myth out of the picture because it's also marketing gimmick that happens a lot. Uh, so really depends on a person. So let's take a menopause patients, for instance. I mean, if you're dealing with severe hot flashes and night nice sweats, and then you know nothing seems to work. You know, estrogen estrogen is not something that's going to be the first thing that we have to look at. We have to look at uh, cortisol as well as progesterone in a hierarchy system. And we have to look at how that person's gut function is, how they're metabolizing some of the hormones, uh, any weight issues they may have, right? If they could clean up their diet, diet plays a huge role in terms of how your hormones are playing into effect. So I can't just say, hey, you need to use bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and fixing all the problems that you might be dealing with. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not about just chasing lab values. And I, tell patients that frequently. It's like, look, just because you're postmenopausal, it's okay that you have postmenopausal lab values reflected here. But if you feel kind of lousy, you're having these symptoms that are keeping you awake at night, in the middle of the day, you're just breaking out into sweats and you're really uncomfortable, then yes, maybe that's something that we want to explore, but kind of uh, diving a little bit deeper as well and seeing what other, like you said, what the adrenals and so on. And then, you know, there are some benefits, of course, you know, with bone density, some cardiovascular protection as well. Um, do we still have that same risk consideration um, with cancers developing in estrogen use? Well, let's talk about that benefit of utilizing estrogen, for instance. When you're using estrogen, the most data in terms of what we're seeing is not using oral form of estrogen, right? When you're taking oral form of, oral form of estrogen, the overall risk behind that is clotting issues. You actually have an increase in um, gallbladder problem on top of increasing 
a uh, sex hormone binding sex hormone binding globule that's a mouthful sometimes <laughs> uh thyroid glo uh, globu uh, globules as well as a fact that you have a lot more issue um in general when you're taking estrogen right so by mouth so you want to utilize topical and the data shows that topical estrogen shows a lot more benefit in dealing with heart benefit so makes sense a lot of times and then when you're talking about how those estrogen being risky it really depends on the pa patient as well you have to look at the overall history gene plays a uh, could be playing a huge role but again, it's all about epigenetics and how you end up having to control that estrogen metabolism into more of a cancerous estrogen compared to being much more beneficial. And that really depends on how you eat, how you sleep, how you end up having to reduce your inflammation, and how you end up having to take care of your gut microbiome. And methylation process is a big one too. So estrogen metabolism has to be looked into instead of telling patients that, hey, if you using estrogen more than a year is is just a cancer factor that you need to stop it right away after one year. Yeah. And so I think that and we had kind of talked a little bit about some of the ways to help encourage estrogen metabolism so that we're not developing, you know, if your set of genetics are predisposing you to kind of go down the pathway of the more inflammatory, inflammatory metabolites of estrogen, um, what are some of the suggestions that we can look into for encouraging proper estrogen metabolism? Yeah, first thing has to be the gut function. So first thing you need to do is have a higher fiber intake, uh, good fiber intake, and as well as you need to have a good bowel movement. So that's the first thing that we need to look at. If the person's not uh, having a normal bowel movement on a daily basis, they're really stuck. Mm -hmm. And that's going to affect their estrogen metabolism to begin with. So we've got to look at that. Second thing that I would recommend doing is uh, adding in crispers of vegetables, uh, especially uh, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, you could even take a supplement for that matter. I, I prefer supplements because you actually have a set dose that you could uh, add in. And as well as there's a product uh, available from other manufacturers, I'm not going to specify specific one, which contains uh, indole 3 carbonyl as well as DIM uh, in actually helping with the estrogen metabolism to get it cleared out properly. So that's one way to handle that. Along with um, calcium degluconate is another one that you can end up having to utilize for estrogen metabolism. So good estrogen metabolism supporter is a must. So that's number three. And number four is muscle mass. Uh, if you're not exercising well, and if you don't have a lack, if you actually have a lack of muscle mass, that overall affects your metabolism, uh, your inflammation, uh, as well as handling a lot of the hormonal aspect that you're going through. I mean, I, I see this all the time in a clinical aspect that people who are overweight, they tend to have a higher levels of hot flashes. They don't do too well with the bioidentical hormones, not because of the fact that it doesn't fit them. It's just that the overall absorption of the hormones topically sometimes, as well as metabolism is far skewed that you may end up having to see a lot more hot flashes when you utilize these things. So many cases, we have to start, start very slow with these patients. Uh, and the depending on the adipose uh, level that the patient might be dealing with, I sometimes choose a patch form of estradiol uh, before we end up having to really get the uh, steady level and then transitioning over to a bioidentical you know, bias. Now, the patches are like the bivalve bat patch or estradiol patches are still bioidentical, but you don't have a unopposed, you have to have an unopposing estradiol factor which can be a, sometimes a issue. You need a right balance between all three estrogen, especially like the estriol, estradiol, and estrone. And estriol actually protects the breast tissues uh, from cancer, uh, as well as their different activity within the body in terms of how those three different forms of estrogen come into play. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a right balance. So just utilizing straight estradiol patches might not be suited for you for a long period of time, but in certain case, I have a discussion with the doctor to transition over to a bias form. And there are different ratios of the bias as well, either one to one or four to one. And that all depends on the level of adipose tissue that we're dealing with. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and I, you know, bringing back the discussion of the different forms of estrogen, I think that um, at least in my training, it was, you know, what is, what are the 
symptoms that we're looking at and kind of how is that body going to metabolize it? So maybe that would be a good point to look at some of the um, sexual dysfunction and vaginal dryness and, and so on. So maybe we can say, okay, what kinds of estrogens should we be looking for um, if we're working with a practitioner? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about that. I mean, vaginal dryness is such a common issue, especially atrophy. Um, utilizing estradiol, even though it works okay, is mm-hmm. not the best one to utilize. Uh, and as well as you may end up having to cause tissue proliferation utilizing estradiol. Uh, again, there's an, uh, there's an unopposing estrogen that's coming into play. I prefer, and there's a lot more data and safety looking at estriol, right? Um, there's a, that, again, that's a different form of estrogen, has a higher affinity to the uh, vaginal tissues, uh, has been shown to be very safe, uh, has not been shown to cause any cancer byproducts. Because if you look at the overall estrogen metabolism, estriol is basically the bottom of the totem pole in terms of the estrogen metabolite. So it's not going to go anywhere, you know, in a, in a case in point, quote unquote, mm-hmm. that you have a better safety when they're utilizing estriol and better effect in efficacy for vaginal dryness and especially for atrophy. So I utilize, uh, at least recommend utilizing estriol uh, around 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram as a vaginal cream. And you could work with a compounding pharmacies to get that compounded because it's not going to be available as a regular commercial product. So that's one way to do it. And then sometimes in certain cases, you may end up having to add in testosterone. Is another product that you can have to add as a combo to help with that. But you got to check how inflamed that person is. So if you look at a Dutch test or a sal- regular saliva test and the person is inflamed and then they have a very low DHEA and high testosterone uh, seen, then you don't want to challenge testosterone as much. You want to probably back away. Uh, those patients may end up having to do better with a straight DHEA vaginal cream or just utilizing estriol vaginal cream, depending on the patient's needs. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, and for the listeners, estriol is E3. So we can kind of look at that as E1, E2, E3, um, where the um, estradiol is the E2. So we're kind of looking at that from two different topical aspects. Um, And estriol, the E3, we're doing more so vaginally. It's not going to be like the topical cream, um, like, yes. Yeah. So for vaginal dryness purposes, let's just say the patient actually starts on bias. Again, bias is the two forms of estriol and estradiol. So E3 and E2 combined. It's It actually helps with a lot of the um, vagal nerve response and um, vasculature. However, it doesn't address the dryness issue until later on, probably six months or so. Right. Um, so because it takes that much of a tissue concentration to generate in that area. So any patients dealing with dryness, you want to start the estriol right away. And that's why a straight vaginal application of estriol, it works a lot faster. And also you need to do a certain loading dose as well. So given point that I recommend doctors to do is utilizing one gram uh, inserted vaginally, do it at bedtime for about 10 days, followed by three weeks, Every, I mean, so now every three, let me take that back. <laughs> three times a week, excuse me, <laughs> uh, then as needed. And actually helps to reverse a lot of the dryness and atrophy issues right away. And after that loading dose, the patients may end up having to just use it maybe once a week or as needed. And they're just able to maintain that very well. Great, great tips. Um, and then let's talk about maybe a segue if estrogen men also have estrogen. Um, so maybe we can kind of talk a a little bit about how men present with estrogen, where we're getting excess estrogens, um, and how that shows up. Perfect. So estrogen, everybody produces estrogen is, and especially when you're talking about, um, fetal development in terms of the overall sexual characteristics that being developed, um, you know, we just came from the one form of, of, of of a, uh, penile tissue development, uh, and that overall region that's all depending on the ratio between you know the estrogen and testosterone and how that ended up having to come into play. So everybody produces estrogen. Everybody has some form of um, dysfunctional relationship between the hormones, depending on how it's being metabolized and mm-hmm. and how it's actually being utilized in the body. So perfect example for guys. You know, guys do obviously they need a lot more testosterone compared to female patients. 
But it's just that because of all the lifestyle factors coming into play, especially if they're not exercising as much, having lack of muscle mass, uh, poor estrogen metabolism. Again, we talked about estrogen metabolism for female when men actually end up having to come into play as well. That can actually push the testosterone into being uh, uh, converted down to estrone, mm-hmm. right? And that's a higher activity of estrogen compared to estradiol, estriol. As a result, you know, patient, men, especially when you're dealing with estrogen, they feel a lot more fatigued. They don't feel themselves. They feel depressed. Um, they end up having to lose a lot more muscle mass. They feel that they're losing their erection. Uh, and then they, certain cases, guys do develop hot flashes as well, right? And then you end up having to see some of the sexual characteristics being developed, uh, such as gynecomastia is a big one because man of man boobs. Yeah, man boobs. We're not going to say the other word, but <laughs> man boobs. So that that's something that we need to really look at. And if if you see any signs of these things, and I'm not saying it has to be all, but any signs of those symptoms I just addressed before, guys should check their testosterone level and as well as their estrogen metabolism. If they see that the estrogen metabolism is higher, you need to do certain things to reverse that. And um, I know some doctors that I've seen that they end up having to use estrogen blockers like anastrozole or brand name is called Rimadex. I don't particularly like that. They end up having to uh, stop the estrogen metabolism uh, too aggressively and in certain cases permanently as well. So I'm not a big fan of that, but there are natural ways to do so. And the first thing you need to do is you need to change your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. That is a must. If you're eating like crap, if you're not exercising, uh, if you're not having the right amount of sleep, especially at least seven to eight hours, a low circadian rhythm uh, balance, um, and as was high stressful events, right? All those things come into play in dealing with poor testosterone uh, production as well as uh, testosterone being converted a lot more to estrogen. And then when you're adding in like toxins like xenoestrogens, right? That plays a, a huge role in terms of that in itself. So that's the reason why when you see the overall sperm count has been decreasing very rapidly for the last 50 years, not because of the fact that guys are producing enough uh, more estrogen. It's not, not that. It's more the fact that there's a toxins getting involved, poor lifestyle choices, and everything coming to play that guys are being demasculinized in many cases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think that the the more studies that come out, the more we realize that so many of the common products do have xenoestrogens and we're just kind of absorbing them. And then, you know, people are trying to do a quick fix and going to a, you know, a testosterone clinic injecting a bunch of testosterone. So they're having kind of this double whammy of the conversion of the testosterone that they're injecting. Plus they're getting it from their environment. Um, so I think that we look, yeah, looking for natural estrogen blockers and not just jumping to the anastrozole option. I know that that's pretty common from what I've seen. Yeah, absolutely. So for guys, I sometimes do put them on dim or indole three carbonyl for a short period of time, just to get their estrogen cleared out. Mm-hmm. The second is again, fiber intake is a must. If they have a poor gut function and not having adequate prebiotic and postbiotic, those all affect in terms of how the estrogen metabolism come into play. And then when you have a poor gut dysbiosis, uh, the activity of the beta glucuronidase is also increased where you need beta glucuronidase to allow the uh, estrogen to be cleared out quickly. It's just that when you have a high uh, levels of that being affected, then you have a lot more estrogen, estrogen being recirculated within the herpetic circulation. So that also affects it as well. So everything should be looked into instead of just looking at testosterone. It happens way too much. I've seen guys where they're utilizing testosterone cyprinate injections on top of using HCG because they notice that if they go straight dealing with testosterone injection, they're going to feel some sensitivity on the chest. So to block that, they end up, or they end up having to see a certain shrinkage in their penile tissue, right? So they end up having to use HCG to pu- to protect that issue and from further happening. Mm-hmm. So you, you're causing one side effect and then using a second medication to block that. And this a, is a point that I really hate seeing doctors doing, but you know, obviously I, I own a compounding pharmacy. I service a lot of doctors and certain doctors are very set in terms of what they want to do. But 
If you if you want to have a proper proper hormone replacement therapy, especially for guys, lifestyle factor has to be changed in terms of how they eat, what they how they exercise. Um, how they end up having to detox on a daily basis, improving the circadian rhythm, how they end up having to poop, right? Uh, all these things has to come into play, and including like mycotoxins, right? right. Mold Absolutely. toxicity can actually play a huge role in estrogen metabolism as well, uh, because there's certain mold toxins like aflatoxins can actually, even fusarians can actually exert that estrogenic uh, activity, right? And that could make it even worse for a lot of people. And that also affects the cardiac function. And I mean, that, that's not something we could be talking about today, but, you know, mycotoxins and heart disease and hormone, hormone metabolism all come into play because, listen, people have issues right now. And it's, it, we're living in a basic cesspool of toxins. And that's including mycotoxins. And we're just not having that enough knowledge or the know-how to address this properly. Right. And, you know, when we're talking about the metabolism, mycotoxins like aflatoxin really hinders hepatic function. So we can't metabolize things properly. We're just taking in all these hormones on purpose or otherwise. Uh, things get messy. Yeah, things messy. get really messy. And then the, the poor methylation process, right? So that's all affected. The glutathione level is completely depleted, right? And then on top of when you're actually having... Um, you know, phase two or phase one being blocked in the overall detox pathway, that also affects that as well. So everything has to be looked into carefully instead of just reaching for some testosterone. I know everybody wants a quick fix. I know everybody wants to be jacked and be energetic like their 20s, but you got to remember why you're there, why that uh, issue that you actually have now have resulted. It didn't happen overnight. It's all the crappy McDonald's and all the shit been eating for the last 20 years. <laughs> and Accumulates. It's to, yeah, it's hard to undo. Um, and so we kind of talked to some of the, the sexual dysfunction in women. So when men present with erectile dysfunction, what are some of the things that we need to be considering? Of course, they come to me because they're thinking of their cardiovascular system, which is great on them. But, you know, it's not always just testosterone either. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a circulation issues. Mm -hmm. it, it is a circulation. There's definitely vasculature, inflammatory conditions that's going on and reducing the inflammation and as well as reversing a lot of the poor lipid metabolism uh, panel that you see is, is a must. And then number two is, how again, how's their diet? How are they sleeping? If they're not getting adequate amount of sleep in a timely manner and have a poor uh, circadian rhythm issue, that doesn't work well. So in certain cases, adding in maybe three to six, or sometimes I put patients on 20 milligrams of melatonin might be something that we need to uh, add in to reverse some of the circadian issues that's going on. Right. And then how stressful are you, right? How's your cortisol level in the morning? Is it jack high that you end up having to go in a full, you know, Chinese fire drill mode that you end up having to try to put fires, you know, throughout the day, that's going to kill your boner. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had to say that. That's <laughs> no, really understood. I think that yeah. we can speak to the people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, that's right. that's basically a, a bono killer, and that's what yeah. it comes out to. And then testosterone does play into effect, but if you look at all the erectile dysfunction drugs, especially like Cialis, Viagra, what is it really doing? It's just increasing vasculature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and perfusion aspect that we need in looking for, but there are side effects from taking all these things. Like especially Viagra being that it's the first a PDE5 inhibitor drug that was on the market, it does have a lot more side effects compared to like Cialis or uh, other, um, you know, second or third generation type of these drugs. But again, side effects, eyesight issues, heavy congestion problems, uh, thirst um, in certain cases, um, you know, if you're taking other nitrate filled drugs, it can drop your blood pressure even more, right? So all these things come into play. And another thing, and I strongly believe, I don't know if there's any studies or not, in terms of prolonged use of these PDE5 uh, inhibitors, is that going to cause my microvasculature damages that all these drugs may not work well down the line? And then what you're resorting to, injectable uh, a prostatil or prostaglandins to actually help to, uh, you know, help with your erectile issue or 
you know, are you going to fix the issue right away so this way you don't go into that effect? The Healthy Heart Show will be right back after we take this quick break to hear from our sponsor. Would you like to drink great tasting coffee that's also good for your heart health? Cardiology Coffee is your answer. This five-star rated coffee is delicious. It's a gourmet coffee that begins with whole organic beans, hand-selected, and carefully roasted. It's tested and certified to be free of pesticides, mold, and other toxins. Cardiology Coffee is great for your heart, and you're going to love how it tastes. Order now online at cardiologycoffee.com. Now back to the Healthy Heart Show. Yeah, so, I mean, we have to think about that short-term fix and what's the long-term effect of that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, it's mind-boggling how even a 17-year-olds are needing Viagra or Cialis for their erection. Yeah. And, I, and, and, a, and a sad part is that the parents are bringing to them to the pharmacy to pick these up, right? So obviously, I mean, not saying getting involved in a right. sexual relationship early on, that's not my point. The point is that we're seeing all these issues coming up very early on. A 17-year-old should not be having all these issues right now. Right. Yeah. So, so, and we still think that that is just circulatory related. Is it circulatory? Is it anxiety issues? Right. right? We haven't. I mean, I, I think there's also this is a different topic for for today, but overuse of pornography and all these things end up having to cause a uh, depression issues or also huh. dopaminergic I- I effect on that. Right. Prostaglant. Um. All these things. It's a societal issue. It's not just about hormones at this point. Right. Well, and with the surging rates of infertility, um, and I mean, young women, so yeah, young men having issues with getting an erection and then young women just can't seem to get pregnant anymore. So it's, I, I don't know. I think that there's like a, a lot of societal issues and then the hormones coming in from the chemicals and kind of a lot of unidentified toxins that are really causing early onset of hormone dysregularity so that when these women get into the postmenopausal years and when these men get into postmenopausal years or andropause years, it's like what they're kind of fighting an uphill battle from the get-go. Exactly. And then not knowing that. And then when you're talking about overuse of birth control pills in young female patients mm -hmm. and how that affects the overall mitochondrial damage and DNA issues uh, down the line in terms of the fertility rate all these things are not really talked about. And so, yeah, the girl, young girls are making decisions based on that um, in terms of what is provided for them. But then if they know what the long-term consequence, consequence is going to be down the line, would they think differently? I think so. I think. And, you know, if I had a daughter, I would never put them on a birth control pill in that purpose. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a sad reality right now. Yeah, it really is. And it's unfortunately kind of the go-to quick fix for so many things of acne, depression, what have you in these young, young women. And it's, it's really unfortunate to see kind of downstream what they wind up dealing with when they're, you know, trying to, yes. so it's, it's really sad, but I think that that brings a, a, across a good point of, like you said, with the adrenals and kind of how that plays into like how, how was it that the adrenals and sex hormones and thyroid hormones, cause they all kind of have to work together. Yeah. So hierarchy wise, I, I still strongly believe that your adrenal function has to be looked at first mm -hmm. and how cortisol and cortisol is not just about the stress response. It's also deals with insulin, re insulin response as well. And as well as sugar control, mm -hmm. if the cortisol response is completely out of whack, that is going to in downturn in a in cascade manner, that's going to affect your sugar metabolism, how you end up having to deal with um, uh, inflammation, deals with in stress response, as well as how the progesterone and other hormones are coming into play in, in your life, all these things. So you have to look at the cortisol response even before. And then when you're talking about like cortisol awakening response or CAR, mm -hmm. that also affects in terms of, you know, how much of a spike of cortisol you have in the morning and how we could end up having to control that depending on lifestyle factors or any other adaptions that's coming to play. Those all have to uh, be fixed because especially for females, depending on how much of a, these hormones are being tweaked, 
females are much more sensitive in, the, in, in that aspect of it. And that also affects their pregnancy rate. Mm -hmm. Right. If they're highly stressed out, they, have, they don't have enough progesterone to actually support the entire pregnancy, that's a failure to wait to happen. So one of the factors that I always tell patients to do is that at least for females in general, for at least one full year before they start to even think about having family, start doing all the functional labs and looking at their uh, cortisol level, their progesterone, their estrogen, and then also looking the factor in terms of all the toxins coming into play, any gut dysbiosis they might be dealing with, right? It's such a common thing that girls have to accept bloating as being normal. Right. If you're having any of those issues right now, there's an inherent issue with leaky gut and inflammation. Right. You need to fix that right away because you think that's going to get better when you get pregnant. It's going to get worse, yeah. right? So all these coming into play and, and fixing that. And then when you're talking about thyroid, that's the second thing we should also look at as well, because depending on if the thyroid is low or high, that also affects pregnancy rate. Mm -hmm. And then when you're talking also about progesterone and testosterone estrogen, those all have to be optimized as well. Right. So if you have any history dealing with mold toxicity, Lyme disease, um, I've, I've actually had a, um, one of our colleagues, I'm not going to mention any names, but even for her, um, going through her Lyme treatment and Bartonella, she's still, even though she's, I think she's like 28, she still not has not been able to get her progesterone level up properly. So you do need some type of progesterone replacement in that time, right? Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to know where you are and how you approach it. Not everybody's going to have a perfect health, but as long as you know what to look for and you work with the right practitioner and optimizing your health to get you prepped to start your family, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good tip. So kind of looking ahead, of course, and then, you know, so say you do find Lyme disease or mycotoxin illness and so on, you think it's um, a good option to kind of support while you're going through the detox. When would you stop a detox when considering trying to conceive? I, you know, there's a given point. I don't think there's any data out there right now, but what, what we see and as well as uh, our, our other practitioners that we work with, they do see a um, easier pregnancy during a detox period, right? Because the hormones are coming to you know normalization. Uh, but is that a proper way to um, help with the uh, pregnancy at that point in time? Probably not, because obviously you're going through a treatment, right. so you don't want any other shift of toxins and such uh, to go into the placenta and affecting the uh, fetal development. So you do need to time it well. Yeah. Uh, and as well as working with the practitioner who knows what's going on. And then afterwards, um, that doesn't just end there. You need to have other nutritional uh, aspects to be supported during the pregnancy that's safe and sound, right? I know um, our common products like Cellcore, they have certain data showing now that's uh, safe for pregnancy use. So in certain cases that has to be done. And as well as optimizing your phospholipid content. I'm a big believer of use of use of phospholipids. Um, that company like Body Bio makes a great, great liposomal phospholipids that you come into play uh, to not just helping detox, but also supporting the mitochondria, cell membrane, the detox pathway, and as well as you need phospholipids for your baby's brain development. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a must. Also, you do need phospholipids for healthy sperm count as well. Right. So all these things come into play. It's about the cellular function. Right. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that um, with the adrenals and the thyroid, it's like there's this whole when those are kaput, you feel really lousy. And then, of course, your mitochondria are suffering. So we really have to get it down to a cellular level and get a lot of cellular support on board. Yeah. So that that's why we should look at these things on a year uh, year before at least give enough time to prep the person's body and as well as for the health of your offspring. You know what determines health of the offspring is determined by the health of the mother, mm -hmm. because the mitochondrial DNA can get damaged from stress and outside factors, mm -hmm. and that's basically what you're passing on to a child. And in terms of the health of the of your grandma, so especially Dr. Lauren, uh, being that you know your female uh, counterpart, in terms of the mitochondrial health was determined by your grandmother, and that mitochondria is being passed on to your mom and then to you, right? So if you have a daughter, 
I'm not sure what you have. Um, I'm having a boy. <laughs> you're having a boy. <laughs> but anyways, if you actually had a daughter, you'd be passing on that mitochondria right. health to your daughter as well. So it's like, you know, you could you could thank your grandmother for for all the health, you know, aspect that you're dealing with because she had severe rheumatoid arthritis so that's not a good thing okay okay let's not talk about that then <laughs> never mind never mind i let me take that back for i want to pe- repurchase <laughs> yeah, for other people out there excuse me <laughs> i can think, i can thank her for my mitochondrial function <laughs> but you know even looking at my mother's health um and then even looking at my um my mother's side of the family for mm-hmm. instance my great grandmother she actually lived until 105 wow so longevity runs in the family. Yeah. And then my grandmother right now, she's actually 96. So, you know, that yeah. mitochondria health is is there. Um, hopefully, you know, I'm able to maintain that. You're gonna get longevity. your 100 year heart. <laughs> oh, ho- hopefully, you know, I went through a heart attack already. If if any listeners don't yes. know about this, I actually had a heart attack when I was 33 years old. I had an 85% blockage in my LAD. And I had to put a stent put in and found out that I had positivity for Bartonella infection and mold toxicity. And that created a lot of issues. Yeah. Uh, but I am completely mold and Bartonella free at this point in time. But you know, that that also affects your longevity aspect of it. So yeah. I think everybody Was that should a long be, road of recovery that you had. It took about two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I just I just had a stint of a mold toxicity again this year, and I was able to clear that out in three months, uh, all because of use of phospholipids and cell membrane support, mm-hmm. uh, use of sodium butyrate as well, because you need the butyric acid for um, the mold to be detoxed out of the DNA of your cell. So all these coming into play, how cell membrane comes to effect is so, so vitally important. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And did you notice that you, so, I mean, being so young with a heart attack and did it kind of take you a while to navigate the fact that it was Bartonella and mold, or were you kind of already in this space of holistic? I've always helped patients deal with this type of issues, but I didn't realize how much it was affecting any patients for that matter, even for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just, I had a very smart doctor friend and a colleague that she was actually telling me to get some additional functional labs done to rule out Lyme disease. And that's what happened. I didn't have Lyme's. I had other co-infections mm-hmm. coming to play and it's, it took a huge toll afterwards. I mean, once you go through that kind of a health issue, it opens your eyes in terms of what possibilities are and as well as helping other patients to reverse those courses. Uh, so that's what I'm really concentrating on these days. I mean, I used to do a lot more hormones than uh, than now, but mm-hmm. now it's actually more a combination of everything in terms of the mm-hmm. hormones and dealing with the mycotoxins and other mm-hmm. co-infections coming into play and how to optimize person's health to recovery. Yeah. Well, I think that's how it goes, right? We think that we're getting into some sort of niche area, like me going into cardiology. I really didn't think that I was going to be diving so deep into mycotoxins all the time, but that with the cardiovascular disease and the rate of mold related illness is so common. I've had to become an expert in mold as well. And, you know, some of these um, environmental toxicities and so on. So we kind of just, unfortunately, things aren't multi, things are coming more and more multifaceted anymore. It's not just as straightforward as "Ah, my hormones seem off. What do you think this is about? It's like, yeah, a lot to unpack. Absolutely. My, my overall LDL level was highly elevated during my, before my mold treatment this year right? It was around the 500s. And then, yeah, I mean, it was totally inflamed. And once I ended up having to get the mycotoxins out, it was down to the normal levels, right? So again, you shouldn't just look at LDL level and then think that, oh, that's high. But the thing is like, that in itself should be an eye-opening moment that mycotoxins causes inflammatory conditions and then high levels of cholesterol being produced. Mm -hmm. And then when you have a low HDL, uh, high ApoB, on top of inflammatory conditions, all that, that's a very big issue as a risk factor for cardiovascular events. Absolutely. And then when you're adding in hormones, right, that all comes into effect in terms of how that cardiovascular function and hormonal aspect come into play as well. So if you have a high levels of, especially for females, high levels of testosterone, low DHEA, cortisol levels completely shot, if you don't have a, uh, and then you're overweight, all that, 
that's just a disaster waiting to happen. So you need to reverse that issue ASAP by mm-hmm. applying lifestyle changes. Paleo diet is a good one to really focus on. I know, mm-hmm. um, I know your colleague, Dr. Wolfson, wrote that book, Paleo uh, Cardiology. I mean, that that's uh, that should be a golden Bible for everybody Absolutely. to be really reading. Freeheartbook.com if you haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Give up for free because it, it must be read. Yeah, exactly. No, that that's that should be a number one point. And that's what I end up having to apply to patients that you need to keep a more of a paleo-based diet to fix all the hormonal issues. And if you want to go a little more stricter, do whole 30. Or there are certain things like mitochondrial supporting diet. And that's basically what it is. You're eating a lot more healthy fat, mm-hmm. right? And uh, applying animal protein and really helping to support the mitochondria because you need those lipids, those phospholipids to help your cell membrane and your cell functions to uh, get back to normal. Right. Um, and, and I'm noticing you're saying higher fat and paleo and not keto. I'm not a big fan of keto as much. Um, I, I know some practitioners, I, I know Dr. Sean Baker is, he's a big on, um, and I respect him a lot and he's big on overall carnivore diet. And you know what? He's like the prime example and does a it works well in those type of scenarios. Does that apply for every patient? Not particularly. And I, I and he even says that it, you know carnivore is not for everybody, nor is it for forever. But for him, he was able to do it for about I think five years at this point. Guy's like fifty five years old. He's benching like three hundred. Yeah. I mean, it's a he's a specimen. Yeah. It's, it's a specimen. incredible. It's incredible. And I've seen patients reversing their. Crohn's disease and other disease states, and including hormonal dysfunctions by changing their diet to carnivore. So I can't say that's a bad thing, but generally about 99% of the time, paleo diet works well for a lot of people because it eliminates all the inflammatory uh, food and oils and uh, all the byproducts and really fixes the diet issue from the get-go. And that's what you need for proper hormonal function as well as metabolism. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And what, like we mentioned across the board with talking about some of the, um, the diet with having the proper estrogen metabolism and so on, we want more fiber. So being so incredibly restrictive on not allowing any fiber in that can, I think, kind of hinder and throw, throw a wrench in things as well. Yeah. I mean, what does your, uh, good bacteria feed off on prebiotics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to get that from, uh, just meat alone. I, I, there's still a confusion going on in terms of how the gut bacteria are coming into play and what they need, what it needs and uh, how it's derived and that you need to have a perfect condition to do so. And when you're just applying straight meat, it's not going to be ideal. Um, so you have to look at that much more differently. Yeah. So we want paleo diet. We want weight bearing exercises good sleep patterns, um, looking at your adrenals um, and having some foresight in terms of having good hormonal health through the rest of your years. Is that kind of a good synopsis, we think? That's a simple way to put that for a lot of people. For generally, unless you're dealing with very complex case, for general population, based on what we just discussed today, should be enough for optimal health. And, and you need to work with the right practitioners. That's the key right now. You need to work with the right practitioner who understands all aspects of the body, not just about hormones, but the gut health, uh, the toxicity response, um, nutritional deficiencies and such, and including psychological health as well yeah. to help you achieve the right health you're looking for. Right. Absolutely. I think that that's a, a really excellent point of that mental health and stress management. And again, that kind of goes back to the adrenals and so on, but really having the good stress management and good mental health. So making it truly holistic. Yeah. And I think there's three core things that I, I like to simplify for a lot of patients yeah. is basically um, toxicity, deficiencies, and psychology, right? All come into play in terms of dealing with that. And then when you go into the subgroup is basically gut health, hormone and immune balancing, mm-hmm. right? So all those things come into play to build up a strong pillar um, because the foundation aspect is what you do as a lifestyle, how you poop, how you sleep, how you deal with stress. That's basically just a foundation. Right. And then you actually have the pillars in terms of gut health, hormone, and immune. Mm-hmm. And then when you're talking about all the other outside factors like toxins, deficiencies, and psychology, 
as all envelope into helping you achieving the right health. Right. Very well said. I like that toxicity, deficiency, and psychology. Um, and, you know, having a good solid foundation to go on with all of that. Yep, definitely. Well, always such a pleasure catching up with you. I know we can do deep dives all, all day long. So I just, I want to encourage again, everybody go back and listen to part one, um, but also where can our listeners learn more about you um, and see all the great beneficial information you post all the time? Yeah, absolutely. I'm very active on Instagram. It's drdr.john.farmd, P-H-A-R-M-D. And then you could also find me on my website, drkimwellness.com. You could also book an appointment to talk about any other health issue you might be dealing with. And then an uh, easy way to, again, to contact me is through Instagram. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I just love picking your brain. You're just an absolute wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauren. That does it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to The Healthy Heart Show. Please help us get the word out by liking and subscribing to our podcast and our Facebook page, Natural Heart Doctor. Please show support for our podcast sponsor, Cardiology Coffee, your resource for organic, antioxidant-rich, mold and pesticide-free coffee shipped straight to your door. Learn more by adding at Cardiology Coffee on Instagram and visiting cardiologycoffee.com. This podcast provides materials for information and educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. We encourage you to contact your physician for any of the health issues discussed here.